Um, I'm the victim. Or as you could um, also, I could be known as I'm a survivor, right? Um, I'm a survivor of domestic violence by William Cromer. And um, it's more than just domestic violence with me. That man changed my life. Um, one of my biggest fears, you know, um, going through life is, you know, ever wondering if you was born with all your, your senses and having one of those taken away from you, right? Um, and so I'm experiencing that and it's very difficult for me because this man did more than just punch me. This man punched me so hard in the eye with one punch that he detached my retina. We are about to watch the parole hearing of an IO man who has been doing these type of offenses for years. Now, that was just a little bit from the survivor. And this hearing, this hearing is personal. And I'll explain why in the unpacking. But with that, let's jump in. Travis, you there? Yep. How are you doing today? Good. Good. So we have Mr. Cromer today. Yeah. Um, so both of the guys that I have today, um, nothing's changed. Both of them are actually um, working out at Lomont, our private sector job in the community. So both of them are um, out in the community on a daily basis, but nothing should be any different with their release plans. Okay. Is there And what is the release plan you have for Mr. Cromer? He's a work release. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Colleagues, you guys have any questions? I don't. All right. I'm going to bring him in. Thank you. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Good. All right. So go ahead and describe to me what brought you to prison, what actually happened that night, and what was going on, any drug use, whatever. Whatever was going on in your life at that time. Okay. Yeah. So the incident that occurred, it occurred um, March 3rd of 2022. Um, I had been in a relationship with a woman by the name of Chris. Uh, we'd been seeing each other on and off for about two and a half years. Um, me and her, we resided at different places. So the situation was sometimes I would stay with her. Um, sometimes she would stay with me at my apartment. Um, the night prior to the incident, um, I stayed at her house, um, and the next morning we woke up, and um, she told me that she wanted to run some errands. She needed to take care of some things, and I became agitated by that. Um, I had been struggling for long periods of time with, with drug use. During this, I was actually on the waiting list to get back into inpatient treatment, so there was other factors, but in short, what happened is I continued to escalate the situation between me and her. I continued to become more agitated by the situation. Um, I wanted my way, and the fact that she was telling me no, that she had other plans, um, I continued to um, not, I continued to um, agitate the situation. Um, she, I was in the vehicle with her. She was taking me back to my apartment. And like I said, I, I continued to escalate the situation. Um, she asked me to get out of the vehicle. I asked her if uh, I demanded that she give me my house keys. Um, and basically what happened is I punched her in the face. Um, and during that caused an injury to her eye that required surgery. Uh, I mean, I'm being honest with you, it's, it's hard for me to talk about this, but because there's shame and there's guilt involved, but I've learned through um, the programming and through Narcotics Anonymous, like the, tr the key to, to overcoming things is to talk about things that are hard for us to talk about. And I did do that. I hit her in the face that day and I hurt her and I had no right to do that. Um, so, I mean, basically in short, I mean, that is what transpired. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. We have a victim today, and I'm going to hand this over to Heather, our victim liaison. So at this time, I just want you to sit back and listen, okay, and do not engage until I come back to you. All right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you.
Heather? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kristen, I just sent you a request to accept that. Thank you. It looks like you did that to panelists. Um, you can leave your camera off or you can turn it on um, when you share your statement. Um, and so you will want to unmute and just be sure that you keep your statement directed at the board and not the offender. Go ahead and unmute and begin when you're ready. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Chris and um, I'm the victim, or as you could um, also, I could be known as I'm a survivor, right? Um, I'm a survivor of domestic violence by William Cromer. And um, it's more than just domestic violence with me. That man changed my life. Um, One of my biggest fears, you know, um, going through life is, you know, ever wondering if you was born with all your, your senses and having one of those taken away from you, right? Um, and so I'm experiencing that and it's very difficult for me because this man did more than just punch me. This man punched me so hard in the eye with one punch that he detached my retina he instantly blinded me instantly my eye was bleeding my eye was protruding out of my head I had to be taken via ambulance from Carroll Iowa all the way to Omaha to the Trollson Eye Clinic where I had to go through emergency surgery for them to reattach my retina I had to return for another surgery where they removed my lens. And then I had to return for another surgery where they put another lens in. And I'll tell you what, that is the most devastating thing when you are blinded and you lose sight and then you get that sight back, but it's as if you're looking through it's as if you're looking through a, gla a glass window with water on it, okay? So everything's blurry. Um, if I was to close my left eye, I would not, I, there's no way I could get through life because I literally can't see. It's just a big giant blur. So I thought, you know, we need lenses to see, right? It puts our stuff into focus. So I had gotten myself the hope that when they put the lens back in, that I would be able to see. And it was devastating, absolutely devastating that I could not see. It crushed me. I had to have a fourth surgery where they could readjust the lens, thinking that may bring me relief. No. So I um, went through the healing process, you know, um, and I've been encouraged by my family, get a second opinion, get a second opinion. So... September 13th of this year, 2024, I went to the Wolf Eye Clinic. Oh, mind you, now I'm have I have issues with that eye, you know, and and whatever. So I went up to the um Wolf Eye Clinic, and on um, September 13th, they delivered the news that I was not wanting to hear. They confirmed I will never see out of that eye again. Um, the damage is too too terrible and um, there's just no hope for it you know by a miracle is what it would be that it came back so I've experienced a lot you know I've went through um, <laughs> being blinded to having hope back to no hope you know and um, if it was just an isolated incident this is why I'm asking you guys not to parole him okay if it was an isolated incident such as this, that's one thing. But it he was he was abusive the entire relationship, you know, and um it it progressively got worse when he was in Carroll and then I moved to Carroll also, but I again I had my own apartment, but it just progressively got worse to where his neighbors were calling the cops and the cops would show up and beg me to do something and I was terrified, you know, I was terrified that I, you know create this chaos in that town you know because I had a really good job working at the super eight 
Um, and I lived in their on-site apartment and I was like, you know, pretty much the main person there, you know, and I just didn't want to cause more grief than already happened to be an employee blinded, you know, going through surgery. Um, back to the um, isolated incident. So what I'm concerned about is the things that he would do when he would abuse me and the sneaky measures he would go. Um, a couple of days before this incident, he had punched me and it knocked the tooth out. And then two days later, well, a day and a half later or whatever, this happened. Um, but before that, there was a time that I was going down the stairs to leave his apartment and he ran out of his apartment behind me and kicked me from behind to send me down those stairs. There was another time that I was in the shower in his apartment and he came running through the bathroom while I'm in the shower with the shower curtain drawn and attacked me through the shower curtain. So I couldn't have seen him coming. So it's like, and I think about how he tells me in the past, I'm not a psychopath. I, you can't consider me a psychopath. I'm the guy that would help the little old lady across the street. But he also would say in the next breath, don't get shit twisted because I have a drug addiction so bad that I wouldn't think twice about robbing her garage after I helped her get in the house. So that's what I fear. I fear the community that you're going to set him in um, could be at risk. You know, I fear also for my own safety, for retaliation. You know, um, not knowing if if he could come back. And what my fear is, I don't get those nice little peripheral visions, right? I don't get to see him coming from behind because that side is gone. That side is gone. And um, furthermore, you know, um, as we all know, that's got two eyes and is used to having their vision daily. And if you was just to cup your hand over one eye and and go throughout that day, just 24 hours, and see how different your life is, how different you view the world because of all the things, the blurry vision that I have to deal with now and the out of focus and the headaches and just that stuff alone. Uh, and I don't, you know, I, again, this is not his fault but he's the one that put me here the state of iowa decides that you don't get to be quote unquote disabled unless you have a lot you've lost a certain appendage or percentage or more in each, each appendage so what i mean by that is i'm completely blind out of one eye and my other eye wasn't the greatest anyways um but because i'm not blinded a certain percentage or more out of each eye I do not qualify to be disability, okay? But we all know that if you go from having two eyes your whole life to one, it, it's a setback. It's a disability, you know? Um, and for that, I'll never, you know, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it's like I'll never, I'll never qualify for that. And I'm sure thinking I'm disabled. Um, and um, lastly, <laughs> this is the hardest one to talk about is the nightmare the nightmares in the night terrors i've never had nightmares like this before and i wake up screaming <laughs> screaming and and i'm completely soaked in sweat i don't get full nights of sleep okay this has been very traumatic to me and um about 2 months ago this is the thing about 2 months ago my my nightmares not all but ceased, but it was like, I wouldn't have a nightmare, but maybe once every couple weeks, you know, um, after I got that parole paper in the mail, instantly my freaking nightmares are back. My terror is back. It's like, I'm waking up in my sleep screaming, please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. <laughs> And it's really hard on me, you know, because it's like I have to continue doing what I need to do to make this better. And I guess what I'm asking, I never asked to be put in this position, but here I am, right? Here's where I'm at. And so because this has happened and because this has brought up these night terrors, I am begging you guys to please not parole him this time. And also, I give you my word that the next time he goes up for parole, I will not 
stand before you and ask for him not to be paroled because I have to get past this and I can't always hide behind asking you guys to parole, right? Not to parole him because I need to know that when he gets out into the public that I can go on with my life and I don't have to worry that he's going to be um, trying to hurt me or I fear that he hasn't learned his lesson and that it could potentially put the next person in his relation in his life or the community as I spoke about the little old lady or the next girlfriend because I'm not the only person that he's um you know abused you know he has an ex that he's abused and so I just fear for the community I fear for the the future girlfriend and um, I fear for myself <laughs> and because I don't get that luxury of peripheral view um, and, and because my senses, you know, are in it right now, it's like, I shouldn't have to be worried that I need to be able to look out behind me because he might come running up. You know, I'm not getting enough sleep as it is with the nightmares and the night terrors. And I just like, then I just want this to be over. <laughs> I just want, you know, now that I've got the clarity on the 13th of September that, um, it finalized it that I won't see out of that eye again. You know, it's like I, uh, now, now that is the day that my life decided, you know, like I've, I've heard it. It was just really tough to hear, you know, <laughs> especially being told that I would see again, you know, and then, and then, you know, when, when you can see out that eye, but it's just all blurry, you think you just, once they put the lens in, you're going to be able to see again. And that's not what happened. And it was devastating to me. <laughs> you know, and, um, and also I do want to say this too, not to get into it. He said, she said, but he's not being honest. Um, what happened when he was in the car, um, he never asked me to give the keys to him. The keys, his house key was on my key ring and my key ring was obviously in my car in the ignition. And he tried to um, just grab the keys out of the ignition. And so when I went to, to, like he was reaching across to grab the keys and I went like that to push his hand out. Apparently my pinky had caught him in, in the eye somehow or in, on the face. There was no mark or anything. Um, and this is exactly what was written up in the in the report that when I went to block his hand from getting the keys, I must have, you know, barely nicked him or whatever. And he just cold cocked me right in the eye. And I mean, it was instant. It was instant. And he got out of the car and ran. Thank you for clarifying that. I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I know that was difficult to do, but we really appreciate your time and the impact of that statement. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. We're going to go ahead and put you back as an attendee and you can continue to listen and hear the decision. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mr. Cromer. Yes, sir. You heard what the uh, survivor had to say. And yes, so I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, I can't. pretend to understand what she's gone through. Um, I do think from the perspective that I have a mother and a daughter and a sister and how I would feel if somebody impacted their life in the way that I've impacted her life is unfair and unjust. As far as the semantics of the specifics of what happened, as far as my recollection, I am absolutely taking accountability for hitting her in the face. There's nothing that she did that would justify in any manner the way that I reacted. And I am truly terribly sorry that the impact that it's had on her life has been so long. Um, and the things that she's had to go through, like I said, I can only try to understand what she's gone through and what she has to continue to go through. She didn't deserve that. And I had no right to act in that manner. Um, I am ashamed of myself. I am ashamed of the person that I used to be. The way that I would treat people, not only her, but a lot of people around me, I'm ashamed of those actions. And um, if I could, if I could take it back, if I could go back and do something different, there's not a day that I don't regret what I've done to the people in my life that I hurt. And I truly am sorry to Kristen and the things that she has to go through because I couldn't and did not control my actions that day. 
She did not deserve that. It was my fault. Thank you for that statement. So the question is, where do you think your anger comes from? Besides the alcohol, besides the drugs, what do you think the core is? Um, I feel like a lot of my anger came from adolescence, um, a fear of abandonment, unstable home life. Um, I grew up around a lot of chaos. Um, I grew up in group homes and, 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 um, I guess a lot of it just feels comes from, um, the way I used to feel was a lot of, um, I was unsure about myself. I was un, 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 unsure of myself. I was insecure of who I was as a man. And when I would have the fear of somebody leaving my life, that fear would be so significant. And my response to it used to be a response of rage. And I would lash out. And that, that anger came from, or really truly came from a place of insecurity. Um, and also as I grew older, it came from a place of entitlement. I felt for long periods of my life that I was entitled and that I didn't have respect or understanding for boundaries. Um, I have no role model of what a healthy relationship looks like. And none of the things that I have to say are an excuse for my bad behavior, because I know at the end of the day, I still am responsible for the things that have taken place in my life. But the fact of growing up in the system and not having a healthy role model, it, it allowed me to continue down the path without boundaries. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Yes, Thank sir. you. Yes, um, I'm going to ask my colleagues if they have any questions for you. And uh, Renee, do you have any at this time? Tell me. Um, okay, so besides Kristen, how many other victims have there been? Um, I had one other prior domestic with my daughter's mom, Dixie Hernandez, in Omaha, Nebraska. Okay. And then what is your relationship with either of these victims at this point? They're, they're non-existent. Um, I haven't been in contact or communication with any of them in, in, in years at this point. Okay. And your intention right now is to go to work release if we were to release you, and that would be in Council Bluffs, correct? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. And then what is your intention after that? Um, so my kids and my mom and my family is from Omaha. So my immediate goal would be go to the RCF um, and then transfer an interstate compact over to Omaha, where I would, my, my, my longer term goal is to return to um, Oxford Living Sober House. I was at an Oxford house while I was on bond uh, for nine months before I came to prison. And I feel like for me to have a successful life and to be able to transition, I feel like remaining at a sober living house for a minimum of a year would probably be the best chance for me to be successful in the community. Okay, and then you have no intention of moving back then toward the victim or where she lives? No, ma'am, I, I do not. Okay, and um, you mentioned your substance use, and at the time of this crime you were using, correct? Yes. It was meth and what? Yes, ma'am, meth, marijuana. Okay, and have you had trouble with alcohol? No, no, ma'am. Okay, and then um, you are you're talking about the Oxford House for Sobriety, um, is there anything else you've done for your treatment for for your substance use in the past that have you found successful? Um, yes. So after this incident occurred with Miss Gross, I completed an inpatient treatment in Manning, Iowa, um, and then I went to the sober living house and I was um, receiving uh, therapy at Good Neighbors Community Health Center um, in Fremont, Nebraska. I, I definitely intend to. Um, stay active in Narcotics Anonymous. That's been a big support. I have a sponsor. I'm in contact with my sponsor, but also um, with the addition of NA meetings, but like to get into therapy and actually have a regular therapist to deal with, um, continue dealing with emotional management and, and, and just do these preventative measures because I don't want to go back to the person that I was before because that lifestyle, the person that I was is not acceptable. That is correct. Okay. And how long have you been sober? Are you currently sober? And how long have you been sober? Um, I went to rehab March 10th of 2022. And I've been completely sober since March 10th of 2022. Is that the longest period you've been sober? Yes, ma'am, it is. All right. Um, I believe those were my... Oh, I have one more question. Okay. So in the past, you had some mental health concerns, at least in your file mentions that. Where is your mental health today? 
And how do you feel about any kind of issues in that space or was it more drug specific? Um, I, for the first five or six months that I was incarcerated, I remained on antidepressants, um, but I feel like I worked through those things with prolonged sobriety um, and a regular routine and schedule as far as um, my diet and my exercise, basically just incorporating coping skills along with therapy. Like I hope to um, not go back to being on medication, but like ultimately my goal is to continue to resolve my mental health issues through therapy. Um, and I think that's going to be something that goes uh, hand in hand with the substance abuse. Um, you know, I, the technical term would be, you know, I understand that I have co-occurring disorder. So my mental health and my substance abuse, they kind of, they have to even out and they're on this, they're, they're, they're both equally as important. So me maintaining my mental health is equally as important as my sobriety. Um, because when I'm not acknowledging my mental health and I'm not involved in my recovery, um, again, I become a person that I'm not comfortable with being. And, um, and so those things are, are crucial and, um, and a top priority in my life from here on out. Thank you so much for answering my question. Thanks, Jesse. Yes, your name, James, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Comar. Yes, sir. Comar. Um, I have pretty much one question. Yes, sir. What did you value? What do you value today that you didn't value uh, from the relationship you shared at one point with Kristen? The thing that I've truly come to value that I that I lacked before, I think, was was empathy, understanding other people's feelings and their boundaries and the value that they have as a person that no person should be put down or yelled at or assaulted or treated in a, in a, in a cruel manner. But the person that I was before, I didn't really have a lot of thought as far as what empathy means and being able to relate the empathy to the people that I love. Like I said previously, trying to imagine what I would feel like if somebody hurt my mother, what I would feel like if somebody hurt my daughter or my sister or my grandma. And the fact that before I didn't value those things. And, 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 and I, I wish I had the perspective that I have now. I wish I had that before because with my sobriety and the level of transparency and um, the things that I've gained, my life would have been in a lot better position if I would have had these things before. And, and I don't think the damage would have been done the way that it has if I would have had the perspective that I have today. Thank you, Mr. Cromar. Uh, that concludes my questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, James. So, Mr. Cromer, um, before we go into deliberation, maybe we're going to make a decision. Is there anything you want the board to know before we go into that to the floor right now? Yes, sir. I, I did prepare a, a brief statement. Um, again, I would like to apologize for my actions. I did hurt Kristen, and I had no right to do that. I know that I'm not the same person I was when I when this happened. I put a lot of effort to making changes. I started doing this by putting together a sincere moral inventory. During this process, I realized that I was not satisfied with the man I was. I spent a lot of my adult life causing conflicts, avoiding responsibility. I used and I abused substances as a way to avoid the reality that I had caused. I used to think that the world was responsible for my shortcomings. I now understand that I was the problem. I am accountable for the things that have gone wrong in my life. I am responsible for the people I hurt. I am also responsible for making sure these things do not continue to happen. Through my support system, my family, therapy, recovery meetings, and self-reflection, I will continue down a positive path. It is my ongoing goal to be an asset to my community and no longer a liability. I would like to thank the board for allowing me to have this interview and thank you for your time. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cromer. I appreciate that. So at this time, just sit back and listen. We're going to go into deliberation. You'll be able to hear us. Yes, when, we're, when we're done, I'll come back to you and explain our decision, okay? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Colleagues. Oh, uh, yeah, I can start this out. Um, initially, after listening to uh, the victim, Kristen, uh, it's, it's uh, 
very traumatic, sad um, experience of what she um, had endured and what she continues to go through and uh, deal with um, uh, from um, what had happened. Um, in light, I was really listening to um, Mr. Cromer's position and wanting to get a sense of where he's at. And I believe with a lot of the drug history, um, the bad examples, the things that he didn't um, appreciate uh, prior to being incarcerated, um, has him on the right path. Uh, hearing him talk about his sobriety and last use was March uh, the 10th of uh, 22. And then just, this is the longest period and hearing about his mental health and substance use and his willingness to want to uh, continue his growth and knowing that uh, he is better without um, the uh, drugs and the mindset and the things he didn't learn that he has learned um, would be beneficial towards his growth. Uh, therefore, <clears throat> um, despite the plea, um, I'm in agreement with DOC's uh, position uh, to work release on Mr. Cromer. Uh, so with a WRG C11P, um, I'm also looking at the 20B, no early discharge. Uh, I'm looking at the 40A with substance abuse and mental health and the uh, 50A or prohibition in alcohol. Connect. Yeah, I, I first want to just thank Kristen for coming forward today and giving us her testimony. Um, the, this is a horrific crime, and um, I just encourage her to continue on her journey to moving forward. And what she needs to understand is our decision today is to not release him from supervision. We're looking at just stepping him down on supervision to where he would serve his entire time, um, but just in a different location. And so um, he's completed all of the treatment that is available to him within incarceration. He's completed his active in his MRT and his RAP plan and many, many other different things. So he's taken a good use of his time while he's been incarcerated. So I too am gonna be moving them forward to work release with a C11P. Another really big piece of this information is that the victim and he will be in different parts of the state um, in totally different districts. And his intention is to continue to move into Nebraska um, and moving farther away. So I think that's a really key to this decision. They would have been different for me had it been in the same community, but he's got a really decent uh, plan to move to the Oxford house where he's had some help before. He's in NA and has a sponsor. Um, I think all of that will be very good for him because this really is an addiction driven problem. And so for that, I also would recommend that mental health and substance use on the 40A. He said he didn't, um, have issues in bars, but folks with domestic violence shouldn't be hanging out in bars. So I'm gonna add the 58. Thank you. So I too, uh, I, I'm gonna be in agreement for this, pretty much the same reasons that uh, Renee had uh, is because of the location that his plan that he seems to have for his uh, release to be away from the victim. Um, and thank you, Kristen, for your statement. It had a lot of impact on me. Um, I just think that what we need to do at this time is to continue the supervision and continue with his mental health and continue watching as he transitions. Like you said, he's still going to be under supervision, but under a different location. So I'm going to go with the same codes, the WRG C11P, the 40A with the substance abuse, mental health, the 20B to go to his date, and the 50A as well. Did I miss any? No. All right, Mr. Cromer. Yes, sir. Um, this was a tough decision for me. I just want you to know that um, you, you really got to stick to what your plan, what, what came out of your mouth. It was 
you have a goal and you have a plan, you need to stick to that plan because there's no room for error. That's all I can say. It really is. So get serious, like you said, to keep that balance between your sobriety and your mental health. And that will be key for you. So we are going to release you uh, to work release. The WRG C11P is a work release code. The 40A is a treatment code. We want you to get a substance abuse evaluation and a mental health evaluation. The 20B is to go to the term of your discharge date, which is 125 of 27. And the 50A is we absolutely don't want you around alcohol, period. No, no liquor stores, no bars, period. Okay? Yes, sir. All right. You have a good day, and that will conclude this interview. All right. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let's unpack this. And for those of you who are saying, oh, well, he's going to, you know, work release and what's the big deal? And he was in work release. It's just a different type of which I don't really quite understand. All you have to do is Google Iowa work release escape and you will see that it, it's a list that goes on and on and on and on all recent. So if you are a victim or as I should say a survivor of someone who you believe is going to kill you, there is no comfort in saying that oh he's on doc work release because you 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 can the, the the it's you can just walk away and it happens all the time it's actually a big problem in iowa you know you watch this hearing and 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 when i start off by saying that this is personal this is personal because Sir Richard suffered um, while he was on 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 active duty, um, a terrible accident. And Sir Richard, I hope I'm saying this right, uh, but but uh, Sir Richard was in the Navy in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, a very prestigious position, and the accident caused him to have severe illness. Um, which affects many part of his body. He's still fighting today for his life. And one of the aspects is his, his, his eyesight. He lost complete, his eyes, de his retina is detached. And he spent a, a large portion of his life blind. And he has had surgery to reattach his retinas. And now he, he suffers with really, I mean, he was able to connect to what the survivor was saying. And when I shared this with him, I could basically feel Sir Richard's rage uh, through the other end, end of the computer and being able to, to associate with her. And by the way, just on that note, the idea that Sir Richard sits in front of the computer for like 20 hours a day or maybe 12 hours a day and fills in these spreadsheets for us with his poor vision, it makes him dizzy. He feels it's in, just incredible. And it, and it hurts because it's still hard for him to... But the idea again that all she's doing she's asking she's saying please you know i was just starting this just happened in 2022 he just pled guilty and she's just starting to be able to sleep better at night and she's really asking she's not asking for much she's saying just just deny him just one more time i need a little bit more time i need a little bit more time that's all i need and i won't come back a second time he only got a five-year sentence. He's only two years into his five-year sentence. And they just don't care. They simply do not care. In Iowa, they do not care about the survivor at all. They don't care about their feelings, what they're going through. It's not something they take into account. And you can see even, you know, just the, is this, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. But again, you have this man who blinds her, her life will never be the same. And the state of Iowa won't do anything for her. They don't consider her to be at full disability. So she's out here. Her whole life is, is diverted. And he, he's out there working, <laughs> making money, being coddled. And he's the bad guy. How does it make sense? It's like, make it make sense. It's, it's crazy.
and they, they just have zero empathy they just don't care and sir richard was even, even furthermore upset because he knows that there is a surgery that they can do because he's been through it himself but it's one hundred fifty thousand dollars an eye but she's being refused to do it they're just not even giving that as an option and you know the one thing that the parole board did positive if you want to look for one positive is after she made her statement he said um so you heard what the survivor had to say he said survivor he didn't say victim and what a speech she caught me off guard when she said that when she started off by i'm a i'm a i'm a survivor and you just it, it's just so look, look at his right and he's young he's what he's like 32 years old <laughs> He looks he looks twice the age. He was 30 when he did this. And so he has in 2016 theft fifth degree. Ten days later, again, theft fifth degree. He has child endangerment. Possession of paraphernalia 2019. Fugitive from justice. So he's already been a fugitive before. Speeding, where he got arrested. Arrested on 4-16-2021 for criminal mischief. Assault, second degree on 2021. 7-16-2021, um, public intoxication. And that's right. He said, oh, yeah, I, I don't have an alcohol problem. I mean, it could be he was on, on meth, and they just said that. 10-27-2021, passing a school bus. Why not? 3 7 2022 dv third offense he did a negotiated plea and I, I i i'm just you know my rage maybe you don't hear it in in my in my voice it's when i first saw this 10 days ago i went on like a rage email campaign with sir richard and, and i'm recording it 10 days later at five in the morning but maybe i'm becoming numb to it Maybe I'm just becoming numb to the insanity at Iowa. But again, this is why we show these Iowa parole hearings. It's just to show. And we'll keep tabs on him. I, I do expect he'll be back soon. Someone like this um, can't control themselves. They're like a lizard humanoid thing. You know, even at the end of her statement, he just it's it's a classic manipulation where he says, I, I can't pretend to understand what she went through. But I have a mother and a daughter, and I can only understand what if they did that to her. And it, it was a very technical answer, right? It was an answer where he's still refusing to have empathy or connect her, in my opinion. It was like one of those classic answers where it's like, yeah, you know, I don't understand. But he could have just said, yeah, I, 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 um, what I did was monstrous. It's, it's crazy. I, I, you know, like there's something that he could have said. I, I don't know that just showed more empathy, more connection versus I, I just don't. I can't. Well, I, I think you can. I think you can put yourself in the situation if someone punched you in the eye and you um, lost your eye. I think that that it is possible to put yourself in that situation. You don't need to connect your mother or your daughter to that. Anyways, but you know, he's out there, out there in the public because why not? And with that, I'll let you go. And um, lastly, this is the hardest one to talk about is the nightmare, the nightmares and the night terrors. I've never had nightmares like this before. And I wake up screaming, <laughs> screaming, and and I'm completely soaked in sweat. I don't get full nights of sleep. Okay, this has been very traumatic to me. And um, about two months ago, this is the thing. About two months ago, my my nightmares, not all but ceased, but it was like I wouldn't have a nightmare, but maybe once every couple weeks, you know. Um, after I got that parole paper in the mail, instantly my freaking nightmares are back. My terror is back. 
it's like I'm waking up in my sleep screaming, please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. And it's really hard on me, you know, because it's like I have to continue doing what I need to do to make this better. And I guess what I'm asking, I never asked to be put in this position, but here I am, right? Here's where I'm at. And so because this has happened and because this has brought up these night terrors, I am begging you guys to please not parole him this time. And also, I give you my word that the next time he goes up for parole, I will not stand before you and ask for him not to be paroled. Despite the plea, um, I'm in agreement with DOC's uh, position uh, to work release on Mr. Cromer. Uh, 